However, let's back up. Let's assume that the Kennedy assassination was in fact a coup. Why would they need to kill Kennedy in the first place? Well, there's a lot of speculation regarding this, but this is what I found. And I quote, John F. Kennedy had this ability to put himself in the shoes of his opponent in order to figure out a satisfactory resolution to a crisis. He figured out that if he pledged that the U.S. would not invade Cuba, well then the Soviets would not need to keep their missiles in Cuba. Thus, after tense negotiations, that was the deal he struck. Except for one thing. It turned out that the Pentagon had U.S. nuclear missiles stationed in Turkey that were pointed right at the Soviet Union. Yes, you heard me correctly. The Pentagon's position was that it was perfectly okay for the Pentagon to have U.S. nuclear missiles pointing at the Soviet Union in a country that was bordering the Soviet Union. However, it was not okay for the Russians to have missiles pointing at the U.S. in a country 90 miles away from America's border. And, uh, yeah, that sounds like something very similar to what's happening in Ukraine, doesn't it? Anyway, JFK saw the hypocrisy of this position, and he secretly agreed with the Soviets that he would withdraw those missiles from Turkey. The crisis was over. The U.S. would not invade Cuba. The Soviets withdrew their missiles, and Kennedy withdrew the U.S. missiles from Turkey six months later. However, the Pentagon and the CIA were livid. They considered Kennedy's resolution to the crisis to be the biggest defeat in U.S. history, end of quote. Yeah, so they're insane. Yes, those were the words of General Curtis LeMay, Chief of Staff to the Air Force. So, during the crisis, this guy here, LeMay, actually compared Kennedy's handling of the situation to Neville Chamberlain's appeasement of Hitler at Munich. So why exactly was the National Security Establishment so filled with rage? Well, that's because Kennedy essentially agreed that Cuba would remain permanently under communist rule, and even worse, headed by a regime that would continue to be friends with the Russians. So, in other words, in their eyes, with this agreement with the Russians, JFK had ensured that Cuba would pose a permanent, grave threat to U.S. national security. Or, so they claim. However, by the time this missile crisis was over, Kennedy had achieved his breakthrough. Determined to bring an end to the national security establishment's Cold War, Kennedy went to a university and essentially declared an end to the Cold War racket. Who is likely to have wanted Kennedy dead? You'd have to say the CIA, but perhaps also the military as well. What kind of a peace do I mean, and what kind of a peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana, enforced on the world by American weapons of war. Both the United States and its allies, and the Soviet Union and its allies, have a mutually deep interest in a just and genuine peace and in holding the arms race. We are both devoting massive sums of money to weapons that could be better devoted to combat ignorance, poverty, and disease. We are both caught up in a vicious and dangerous cycle. He announced that from that day forward, the United States would live in peace and friendly coexistence with the Russians, and the rest of the communist world for that matter. Reflecting his new vision for America, he entered into a nuclear test ban treaty with the Soviets. He tried to withdraw troops from Vietnam, and proposed a joint trip to the moon with the Soviets. So, at the moment he was assassinated, JFK actually had an emissary meeting with Fidel Castro. And all of that was taking place while the CIA was conspiring to commit yet another assassination attempt against Castro without JFK's knowledge or consent. So, after JFK's speech on peace, the war between him and the U.S. establishment over the future direction of the U.S. was on. There could be no compromise. There was going to be a winner and a loser. And then, you know, Kennedy said that he was going to break the CIA into a thousand pieces and scatter them to the wind. And so, yes, Kennedy's enemies in the national security establishment hated him for what he was doing. In their eyes, I guess, what Kennedy was doing as president, after all, constituted a much graver threat to national security than President Arbanz in Guatemala, who the CIA had violently ousted in a coup in 1954, because Arbanz, like JFK, was becoming friends with the Russians. So take a look at this advertisement in the Dallas Morning News on the morning of JFK's assassination, and then take a look at this flyer that was being circulated in Dallas on the day of his assassination. The sentiments expressed in those two documents reflect the views of the U.S. establishment. In their eyes, Kennedy was a cowardly traitor whose policies of appeasement were leading America to doom. So they knew it was a virtual certainty that Kennedy would win the 1964 election. 
Yes, they also knew that he would never permit them to go into the Middle East and begin killing people, thereby producing the sentiment carried by terrorist groups that would justify a perpetual war on terrorism in the future, which of course did replace their war on communism. Yes, they knew that if Kennedy's vision were to prevail, the national security establishment would have nothing to do. With no big official enemy, they would be left to twiddle their thumbs, which would also impact their defense funding. Now, in their eyes, even worse, if JFK did this, they were worried that the American people might begin to demand the restoration of their founding government system. You know, a limited government republic. And uh, yeah, they can't have that, can they? But as we all know, Kennedy's vision did not prevail. Yes, unfortunately, he lost the war against his enemies within the military and the CIA when they killed him just five and a half months after his speech on peace. So the assassination of JFK elevated to the presidency Lyndon Johnson, whose Cold War mindset matched that of the Pentagon, the CIA, and the NSA. So taking out JFK led to massive amounts of money flowing into the defense industry. The war on communism was ultimately replaced by the war on terror. And now, with its NATO machinations in Eastern Europe, the national security establishment has succeeded in achieving Cold War number two, which is going to be a hot war and probably World War III, which is ultimately what they want. And uh, yeah, who says the Kennedy assassination is not relevant today, huh? Because it is. All of this stuff is connected. And you know, this is also how you can know they are full of shit. The government and intel agencies were committed to a war on communism, which later transformed into a war against terror. And now, they are fighting a war against freedom and are advocating for communism. Strange times, strange times indeed. Anyway, after Kennedy was killed, the central bankers, the Fed, the intel, and military industrial complex were unopposed. The petrodollar came into existence, and ruling the world was in their hands. It was palpable. However, cracks were beginning to form. So this brings us to the 1980s and the 1990s. George H.W. Bush knew that the liberal economic order was beginning to show foundational issues. Their power was beginning to wane. And so they declared a new world order again. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order. A world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be. We have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. It is pretty interesting that the petrodollar and the limits to growth report, which we have talked about many, many times, you know, it led to Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030. Well, the petrodollar and this target transition date for this new world order, you know, Agenda 2030, well, they were both conceived in 1973. This alludes to the possibility that this was all planned. I mean, what are the odds that this plan to initiate an economic transition, a plan to have the West maintain global control by switching to a carbon-based economy by the year 2030, and the dissolution of the gold standard, the petrodollar? Well, it was all formed in the same time period. A coincidence? I think not. 